In the spring of 1942, the American Pacific Fleet is beginning to recover from the beating it took at Pearl Harbor. None of the Navy's seven aircraft carriers were in Japanese bomb sites on December 7, 1941. In the months that followed, carriers engaged in hit-and-run attacks on enemy bases. Early in May, an enemy force led by three carriers is making an end run around New Guinea to capture Port Moresby. If they succeed, they will have a springboard to invade Australia. To stop the oncoming enemy, a U.S. force moves into the Coral Sea, spearheaded by the carriers Yorktown and Lexington. The result is the Navy's first major fleet engagement of the century. For naval historians, this is a first. The first sea battle in history in which the opposing surface forces never come within sight of one another. The Lexington's fighter squadron commander, now retired Vice Admiral Paul Ramsey, remembers this battle. Of course, we didn't see each other except by uh, air. We didn't see, the surface forces didn't see each other. In most sea battles, normally the opposing forces are inside of each other. In this particular case, they were anywhere from uh, 300 miles to 100 miles away. We made attacks on them and did some damage, which at that time we didn't know, but we caused quite a lot of havoc. In the meantime, the Japanese had attacked the Lexington and the Yorktown. They put one bomb in the Yorktown flight deck, which did not uh, severely uh, handicap her for landing operations and takeoffs, but the Lexington had received three hits. My squadron, we had uh, been gone so long, I said, we just don't have fuel enough to get to Yorktown. It's better to land on a flaming deck hoping to put the fire out than to land in the ocean and lose all our aircraft. So they let us land aboard the ship. No fire pressure on any of the hoses throughout the ship, which was just devastating. So after, uh, oh, maybe two and a half or three hours, it uh, got so bad that uh, uh, the skipper said to abandon ship. The Lexington sank during the night with her battle flag flying. Also sunk an American destroyer and an oiler. Japan loses a carrier and a second is damaged. Who won? In the view of Captain Ted Tuleha, naval historian, although they sank more of our ships, they did not get Port Moresby, which was the essential aim of their war plan. So the aircraft carrier uh, involved in, in this battle proved to be the essential instrument. Yet there was another test that was required whether a, an entire fleet could be knocked out because of the presence of air power. The Navy prepares for the inevitable next test. New Navy pilots are being trained by the thousands. Shipyards work around the clock. But time is running out. On the staff of Admiral Chester Nimitz, Pacific commander, a team of code breakers has untangled a mass of enemy radio messages. They contain grim news. Early in June, hardly a month after the Battle of the Coral Sea and 5,000 miles to the north, Admiral Yamamoto plans a massive attack on Midway Island, a strategic American outpost. His objectives are to secure an advanced base for new all-out attacks on Pearl Harbor and to lure the remnants of our Pacific fleet to annihilation. The odds are overwhelming. Admiral Nimitz has no battleships against Yamamoto's nine. Only eight cruisers against 15. Facing four Japanese carriers, the Hornet, Enterprise, and hastily repaired Yorktown. But we have the advantage of knowing Yamamoto's plan. Reinforcements are flown into the Midway-based squadrons. The battle commanders, Rear Admirals Frank Jack Fletcher and Raymond Spruance, place their three carriers in wait north of Midway. Wade McCluskey, then commander of the Enterprise Air Group, now a retired Rear Admiral, remembers how it started for him. I was called into Admiral Spruance's cabin and he told me then it could be a turning point because we had very few ships left. 
So if this was going to be a major battle and we were defeated, well, that meant the end of the war, practically. Then at, well, it was 8 o'clock before we actually got a report of the Japanese striking force, which included their carriers. And uh, then, then it became uh, our time to take off. Fiercely, unflinching, knowing the stakes, eight waves of our airmen go after the Japanese fleet, dive bombers, torpedo planes, and fighters. The American carrier pilots, with the odds stacked high against them, will score an incredible victory. About five after 12, using binoculars, and I was still at 19,000 feet, I discovered straight ahead about 30 miles of Japanese striking force. Unaware of the nearby American carriers, the Japanese are caught at a great disadvantage. In the sights of our dive bombers as they scream out of the sky, our Japanese flight decks packed with airplanes and high explosive bombs. The Japanese pay a heavy price. When the Holocaust ends, their four carriers with their planes and a cruiser are at the bottom. What makes Midway so distinctive in contrast to the Coral Sea is that it was a decisive battle. Uh, clearly, this was the end of, uh, the beginning of the end of Japanese naval power in the Pacific. But we also pay a price. Our carrier Yorktown is lost, and more than a hundred airplanes put out of action. We had terrible disasters, and I think particularly with our torpedo planes. These uh, were really old-fashioned types of aircraft to engage in a, a modern battle. And uh, the torpedo squadrons, which took off from the three carriers we had available, uh, got slaughtered. One was wiped out completely. This was uh, Torpedo Squadron 8 under the command of uh, John Waldron. Uh, there was one survivor. His plane crashed, but he was fished out of the sea a little later. The one survivor of Torpedo 8 at Midway is George Gay, today an airline pilot. Most of us were brand new ensigns right out of training. When we got to Midway, and were to make our takeoff, it was the first time we'd ever carried a torpedo, pickle as we called them. We just went into the fleet, tried to get around the, the, the destroyers and then the cruisers and things to take whatever came first as a target. They had about 75 airplanes down there trying to eat us up, and we only had 15, so we didn't last very long. I was tail end Charlie, last aircraft in the whole formation. And I was kind of sitting back here watching this whole thing. I made my attack on this carrier, and I somehow got in close enough to drop my torpedo and get through. I couldn't use this hand. I had a bullet in here and one in this arm. The zeros jumped on me again out on the other side and shot me down. So when I came back to the surface, bumped into my life raft. Also, this black cushion. I didn't want them to pick me up. So I put this cushion over my head, and I would turn this sideways to any ship or anything that was close, and I could watch them out of the corner. I'd see through this thing. They were looking at me with binoculars, but they'd see this thing and assume that it was a box or a piece of debris or something rather than my head bobbing up out there, and they passed me up. I was able to stay there all day, even though they were picking people up all over the place. I'm sitting right in the front row here of this big battle, I saw our dive bombers come in and knew all those boys too and I knew that uh, this was their first dive not only uh, with a bomb aboard but in that airplane. So I was just cheering like a football game. A PBY came by, landed on the water and picked me up in this PBY. Took me into Midway. I lost about 24 pounds during that time. When I got down to Pearl Harbor and the Admiral came in, Admiral Nimitz, he said uh, he wanted to know about it. A fisheye view and a front row seat to the biggest naval battle in history. Uh, well, I'm kind of proud of that. I don't want to go through it again just to lose 24 pounds, but uh, it was uh, something to remember. A grateful nation comes to idolize these flyers who can leave their mobile airstrip with no assurance it will be afloat to come home to. In all their jokes, they laugh off the mortal danger of their trade. 
One pilot, amid the chaos of an aerial dogfight, radios to his squadron, buy war bonds. Somebody's got to pay for all these fireworks. Another, overwhelmed by zeros, radios his ship. I've got four already and 30 more cornered. The deck crews scoffingly call the flyers Airedales, but worship them. The flyers make no secret of their own respect for the deck crews. I trusted the man that put that aircraft under me, and I think that's a supreme compliment you can pay somebody. The enlisted man, whether he's the man in your squadron or whether he's a shipboard deck handler, the man that unhooks your tail hook, the man that uh, catapults you, or the man that moves you between planes. Gene Valencia. My plane captain was 19 years old, 18 years old, Sammy Bell from the Essex. And I just have to ask him, is the plane ready to fly? One subject is strictly taboo. In the wardroom, after a mission, as they count empty chairs, their only comment is bleeding silence. The one thing that I've tried to keep with me when I lost friends, uh, my fellow pilots, uh, and pilots that I didn't know so well in my various commands, was that that individual was doing something that he loved. By mid-1942, a little brother of the attack carrier begins to come off the ways in increasing numbers. The escort carrier, nicknamed Baby Flat Top or Jeep Carrier, is about a third the size of an attack carrier. Carrying only 30 planes apiece, they give support in troop landings and also play a key role in hunter-killer groups that roam the mid-Atlantic to fight wolf packs of German submarines that are cutting the lifeline to England. Dan Gallery, now a retired rear admiral, commanded a jeep carrier in the Atlantic. For one long period, we were losing over half a million tons of ships per month. Altogether, we lost several thousand ships. The uh, shore-based airplanes we had early in the war were not uh, long enough range to reach all the way across the Atlantic. And so there was a so-called uh, mid-ocean gap. Our CVEs came along and uh, closed that gap up. When they did, uh, the CVEs uh, really made a shambles of the sub-fleet. In this bizarre war between birds and fish, the jeep carrier Guadalcanal manages to capture a whole live submarine. We took it in tow and brought it home. And incidentally, it's now parked at the Museum of Science and Industry in uh, Chicago. In the Pacific, both sides have been so badly mauled that there are no major fleet engagements for a whole year. We use the pause to bring out a new generation of carrier planes. The Wildcat fighter gives way to the Hellcat and Corsair. Swifter, more agile, they fly higher and have better guns. The dive bombing Dauntless is succeeded by the Helldiver. The torpedo plane Devastator by the Avenger. The Navy gives them letter number designations like F6F and SB2C. The pilots have their own names for planes they dislike such as Beast and Turkey. But the Hellcat wins a famous tribute from Jean Valencia. Well, I was so happy with the plane, when I got back aboard the Yorktown, I said if the F6F could cook, I'd marry it. We were awfully proud of it. It was a rugged plane. It maybe wasn't quite as maneuverable as the uh, Zero, but it could, it could stay with it. And uh, it was tough. The new Essex-class carriers, which had been on the drawing board before the war, start reaching Hawaii in May 1943. The Ford Island Tower greets one. You look good out there, honey. The new ships become the heart of a fast carrier force, screened and protected by battleships, cruisers, and destroyers carrying thickets of anti-aircraft guns. The task force is organized in groups of three or four carriers, each of which can operate independently. At times, this awesome force will include as many as 17 attack carriers, stretching 50 miles across the sea, 
capable of putting more than a thousand planes into a single strike. No fleet in history has ever packed such a punch. A vast service squadron following in its wake serves as gas station, grocer, arsenal, and machine shop, enabling the carrier force to stay at sea months at a time. The enemy, often under simultaneous attack at widespread points, becomes convinced there must be two such forces. We encourage their confusion by giving the force two alternating numbers. It's called Task Force 38 when assigned to the 3rd Fleet, and Task Force 58 when it is with the 5th Fleet. It is alternately led by Admiral John McCain and Mark Mitchell, who is to be remembered as one of the Navy's greatest admirals. Retired Admiral Arleigh Burke was Mitchell's chief of staff. And he knew his aviation. He'd been in aviation all of his life. He knew when an air group was getting tired. He talked to a lot of pilots every time they came back from a flight. One of the best naval officers I've ever known. In February 1944, the task force tackles the heavily fortified island of Truk, main anchorage of the enemy's Central Pacific Fleet, called the Japanese Gibraltar. Captain Armistead B. Smith found himself in history's greatest dogfight, in which our tactics and new planes paid off 15 to 1. The enemy put up a lot of airplanes. Then they began attacking, and they didn't stop attacking for the entire operation. Every time you turned around, you could anticipate another airplane. I had a lot of luck, and I shot down three airplanes, but at the same time, I got shot down myself. At truck, as in other Pacific battles, submarines aid in picking up downed aviators. Retired Rear Admiral Richard O'Kane skippered the tank. About noon on the first day, we received the first report. By the time the tank finished the job, it was on course for Pearl Harbor with 22 very happy down pilots on its passenger list. As far as I know, and I've, I've inquired, uh, every, every lad that came down alive uh, was rescued. Uh, there were no prisoners taken. Moving closer to the Japanese homeland, the task force hit Saipan in the Marianas Islands. It leads to one of the great Navy legends, an overwhelming air victory that a flyer nicknames the Marianas Turkey Shoot. Later in the June afternoon, Mark Mitcher sends his flyers after the retreating enemy at extreme range. Alexander Brashew was one of those flyers. I know that a lot of us gave a salute as we were going across the deck because we figured that that was the longest uh, carrier strike. Uh, it just didn't seem uh, too probable that uh, some of us may get back. So, but we went into it with that realization, and uh, before you know it, the two hours passed, and we hit them somewhere around 6.30, just before uh, sunset. Mission accomplished. But night has fallen. In the dark, hundreds of flyers grope their way home, fuel running low unable to locate the carriers. Aboard the Hornet, Rear Admiral Jocko Clark gives the word to his carrier task group, lights on. The task force takes a calculated risk that no enemy forces are within striking distance. Admiral Mitcher passes the order. Across the whole task force, running lights and searchlights pierce the black night to guide the pilots in. We knew that there were land-based aircraft up Come, they could come down from Iwo Jima, from that area, and there might be there might be some Japanese uh, carrier aircraft too. But the admiral said, just as soon as we got into the wind, turn on we turn on the lights. Alexander Brashew was returning from that mission. I just couldn't believe uh, that anyone would turn on the lights. Uh, it was against. Like you say, all doctrine, it was against all experience. It wasn't until they said, land at nearest base, and uh, that and then the signal getting stronger, that I was able to visualize that it was, in reality, that very point, that the lights were turned up for us. As we move to liberate the Philippines, the Jeep carriers have their finest hour in the battle for Leyte Gulf. Never intended for a major fleet engagement, 
a division of these midgets suddenly find themselves facing the big guns of an enemy battleship force. David was face to face with Goliath. Retired Vice Admiral J.P. Whitney was a jeep skipper then. He remembers sighting the Japanese battle wagons coming toward him. They looked like pagodas walking on the water. Here they were, coming over the horizon, right straight for us. Well, there wasn't anything to do but to turn around and start running. While this was going on, of course, we were arming the rest of our planes. But in order to launch, we had to turn right back into the Japanese fleet again, because that's where the wind was from. Of course, all this time, we were under fire, you understand. On the uh, CBEs, we had one five-inch gun on the stern. Well, in order to maintain morale, we were throwing smoke at that time and everything else. The carriers launched their air groups to pound the enemy fleet from the sky. In the late morning, after we'd been under fire for over two hours, the Japanese admiral turned around and headed back. I read somewhere that he thought that he was running into the heavy, heavy carrier groups. And here we were, just little CBEs. The last spring of the war finds us on Okinawa, doorstep of Japan. In desperation, the enemy launches mass suicide attacks called kamikaze, or divine wind, for a storm that saved Japan from an invasion fleet in times past. In all, Japan sends more than 2,500 planes out, laden with high explosives, to hurl themselves down on the decks of the fast carrier force. Most are brought down before reaching their targets. Some fulfill the goal of the divine wind. But the task force continues to operate throughout the Pacific and becomes known as the fleet that came to stay. Not one Essex-class carrier is ever sunk. And the Franklin, after bomb hits, explosions, and fires that kill and wound a third of her crew, makes history by sailing 13,000 miles home to New York, the most heavily damaged Navy ship ever to make port under her own power. With the Japanese surrender in 1945, a war ended in which the aircraft carrier had taken the place of the battleship as the spearhead of naval power. Our carriers had been required to cover great ocean areas and their aircraft to hit targets against the opposition of powerful sea and air forces. This they did. And their role did not end with the war. Simply by being on hand, the Navy's powerful gray diplomats have been a stabilizing influence around the world. In the Korean War, Jets from carriers go into combat for the first time, supporting ground forces, knocking out enemy supply routes and bridges. In the 50s, carriers take on a new look, with powerful steam catapults to give an extra shove to the much bigger planes. A new angled deck separates the landing area from craft parked on the flight deck. An astonishingly simple and efficient mirror for night landings puts a beam of light astern up the glide slope that the returning pilot can follow down to a safe landing. The meatball, they call it. In the missile crisis of 1962, carriers help blockade Cuba until the Russians take their nuclear rockets home. As new carriers like the Forrestal and Kitty Hawk go to sea, Older attack carriers switch to the role of submarine hunter-killers with radar systems that see over thousands of square miles of ocean and sonar that can hear down to its depths. In Vietnam, a new enterprise, eighth ship with that name and the largest ship ever built, joins Task Force 77. On its nuclear-powered engines, this marvel can cruise 20 times around the world without refueling. New planes like the Phantom, Crusader, Skyhawk, Vigilante, Corsair, and Intruder have taken their places on the catapults of our Navy's carriers. Captain Julian Lake, skipper of the John F. Kennedy, has seen carrier flying come of age. The type of flying that we do has become highly precision. 
We're doing things now that uh, they never dreamed of doing back in the early days. We take the whole air wing complement of a modern attack carrier and operate it in just about all kinds of weather conditions, day and night. Back when I started flying, the night business was a specialty. To the new pilots who fly the new planes, Artie Doyle, a retired admiral who won his wings a half century ago, pays this tribute. The first plane I handled probably didn't uh, cost more than a uh, few hundred dollars, uh, a few thousand dollars. Think of a young ensign, graduate of the training command, being given a $3 million airplane and told to land it aboard an aircraft carrier. They're the cream of the country. In the half century since a coal ship was converted to become our first aircraft carrier, a whole new world has come into being with new confrontations, new crises, and a naval doctrine in which the carrier serves as the primary guarantee of the free use of the seas. I think the, the best word for the attack carrier or for the aircraft carrier itself is versatility. It has run the gamut from uh, being a tool to support amphibious operations to showing the flag at one time, not so much anymore. It was uh, a very important part of our nuclear deterrent force, but it could immediately shift from that purpose over to a limited war purpose. As you well know, in Lebanon, this was demonstrated. In every engagement or confrontation that we have had, virtually every one, the attack carrier has had a vital role to play. And I see no lessening of that role for many, many years to come. More than ever, the tribute that World War II correspondent Ernie Pyle paid the aircraft carrier still holds true. A carrier is top-heavy and lopsided. It has the lines of a cow. It doesn't cut through the water like a cruiser, knifing romantically along. It just plows. Yet a carrier is a ferocious thing, and out of its heritage of action has grown its nobility. Every navy in the world has as its number one priority the destruction of enemy carriers. That's a precarious honor, but it's a proud one.